Para celebrar los precios sorprendentemente bajos de State Farm, le dimos una letra sorprendente a esta canción. Llamando a State Farm me encontré estos precios bajos y cambié con precios sorprendentes ahorro mes a mes ahorrando dinerito está todo bien. Como un buen vecino, State Farm está ahí. The Pio Art Gallery, Museum and Archives, also known as PAMA, is pleased to partner with Caribbean Art Fair, Black Artist Network and Dialogue, and guest curators Karen Carter and Craig Manuel to present When Night Stirred at Sea, Contemporary Caribbean Art. This exhibit aims to connect Caribbean artists to the broader art world and includes local and international talent, including Brampton's own Janice Reed. The exhibit right now is open virtually and eventually on site once PAMA is able to open to the public. For more information, please visit pama.peelregion.ca. New Theory Radio is presented by PAMA, the Peel Art Gallery, Museum, and Archives. You are listening to New Theory Radio. Hello and welcome to New Theory Radio, the show we theorize on arts and pop culture. My name is Matt Bamba and I am your host and you're listening to us live here on News Talk Saga 960 AM. And I'm very excited to start the show with good friends of NTR. They are a thought leader and community builder within the arts and culture space within Peel region. I'm pleased to welcome PAMO, the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives, to New Theory Radio, specifically three individuals who are going to not only provide some details on how their year has gone this year, but also shed some light on what they got planned for 2021. So joining me on the line to talk about this in further detail, I have uh, the education specialist herself, Allison Verbanic, as well as the supervisor for community engagement, and Penny Cook. And last but not least, the supervisor for arts and culture, Michelle Gerwartz. Ladies, thanks so much for joining me here on New Theory Radio today. Thanks for having us, Matt. For having us. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to talk to Pamela. You guys have always, you guys have always, always have something going on. And I think, you know, despite the year that we've had, uh, Pam has really done a fantastic job in just keeping going and, and being able to still contribute to the arts and culture scene uh, within Peel and really pushing it forward. So well, I'm, I'm going to start with a, with a hard hitting question because I know uh, we're, we're kind of inching towards the end of the year. So there's always a lot of reflection during this time. So maybe I'll, Allison, I'll ask you, um, despite everything that's happened, how would you describe Pam's 2020? Um, the word pivot is now part of our regular vocabulary, <laughs> and we've been lucky enough to still work with such great teams and artists um, to showcase the work from around the region of Peel and expanding our reach over the past year. And from a community engagement standpoint, how has PAMA really stayed connected to, to its surroundings and, and to, the, to the community at large? Well, Pam has had to adapt, I think is the other word I want to use uh, this evening. Uh, 2020 has actually provided us with a great opportunity to challenge ourselves and look at dif different platforms in which we can exhibit our work and reach out to our clients in the community on a whole. So I think it's provided us with a great learning opportunity so far. And hopefully into 2021, we'll see how else we can grow. Awesome, awesome. And Michelle, do you want to add to anything that Allison or Anne have uh, have mentioned so far? Oh, no, I think they gave really, really great um, answers. I mean, it's definitely been a challenging year for everybody, um, you know, having to adapt to virtual environment and making sure they take yourself off mute, which I am very guilty of forgetting to do. So I'm, you know, <laughs> talk away and someone has to say to me, 
you're on mute. Um, but no, I, I'm just so proud of my colleagues um, and, and what they've accomplished by pivoting um, and just doing some really standout programming and, you know, some really new and innovative uh, things like, you know, little web series like, you know, from the curator's couch and things like that, where our curator, um, you know, often talks to her her cat um, about, her, about, you know, her favorite items in her collection, what she does for her day job and her cat, you know, with the kind of bored indifference that only cats can muster. But I, I know our audiences have found it very engaging. So, Yeah, and it's quite interesting because if you think about PAMA and, and even the physical space that you guys have in downtown Brampton, very much the the premise of the gallery is really foot traffic and getting people inside and getting people to check out the work of artists and really immerse themselves with it. And obviously a lot of that was discouraged this year because of the pandemic. But mm -hmm. I, I must say, I think the fact that a lot of the exhibits sort of for the tail end of the year have gone virtual, it's definitely showing what's possible regarding adapting and, and pivoting and, and still being able to to create experiences that people can can find enjoyment uh, out of. And, and, and I'm curious, you know, what are you most proud of this year? Maybe Allison, we'll go back to you for that one. I think it's just been how well our team has really adapted. Everybody's really come together with fresh ideas, with new ways of connecting with the community and with each other um, and being really kind of quick on their feet to come up with stuff. I know, our marketing team has done such a fantastic job of kind of organizing all of the different moving parts, um, which has been absolutely fantastic. For me personally, I had the pleasure of working with the Brampton Library for one of our Connections Art and Book Clubs, where we were welcomed um, to talk about one of our exhibitions and then pair it with uh, talk about a book. And we even had participants joining us from Japan, which would not have been possible. Wow. Um, if it was just a normal kind of Thursday evening at PAMA itself. So that was a really special kind of opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's actually amazing because again, before the pandemic, majority of, of PAMA's reach would be, I guess, Peel region for the most mm -hmm. part. But now going virtual with book clubs and exhibits, you really are reaching all, you know people from all over the world, which is, which is quite fascinating. Yeah, it's been so special. And I know we even had some participants from France for one of our talks and some special friends from Nova Scotia who joined us. So it's definitely a really great opportunity to connect on a wider scale and then kind of bring the Peel community a bit tighter to each other as well. And what's on tap for the remainder of December? Because we are, you know, as of this recording, we're, we're inching, you know, we're pretty much in the middle of December, inching towards the end. But Obviously, the calendar doesn't stop. Uh, what's what's planned for the remainder of the month? Oh, interesting. I think you kind of reversed the questions because that was more of an Allison question, but I can definitely weigh in on that. <laughs> I'm sure you can answer it. <laughs> we, we actually have our planning for our winter break activities happening next. So we have a 10-day span in which we offer um, downloadable content for parents and families to utilize. So uh, we encourage all type of interaction with that. So, I mean, we really want to close out our year on a very positive note. So like I said, there are three days in which we're offering kits, but for the other seven days, these are activities that people can do at home and use household items and participate in. So we want to really engage the fact that uh, with clients and the fact that we know that now uh, that some of the schools are actually going to be at a little bit longer than what we had originally you know, planned for. Mm -hmm. So we want to have those resources available for everybody so they can, you know, come visit us on our site and fill their days with something else. Yeah. And, that, and that's great because as you know, this, this pandemic, especially with those that are in school has been very unpredictable. So I think having uh, programming that parents can utilize at their home and, and really have a resource like PAMA to help them engage their kids, I think is so crucial, especially during the holiday break, because I think, you know, admittedly, this has been a stressful time for for a lot of students, you know, going back to school amidst a pandemic. So what better way to to get their mind off of things than engaging them with some educational but artistic programming? Oh, definitely. Uh, Michelle, we're, we're coming off of or actually we're, we're still going on is One Night Stirred at Sea, which is a virtual exhibit celebrating Caribbean contemporary art. And it's still continuing. You know, you guys have your 
360 degree experience and yeah. I, you know, works in multiple ways. The second artist talk with the painters and mixed media artists is actually taking place in January. Um, before we jump into just more details about that talk, how has the exhibit gone? Like we've had a, we've had a few of the artists here on, on new theory radio and we're very grateful for the opportunities. And, you know, I must say uh, this exhibit seemed um very, very mainstream, but also very much needed for mm-hmm. an area like Peel and, and, and the fact that it's full of such diversity. So, so how would you say that despite the challenges from this year, uh, how would you say One Night Stirred at Sea has, has gone so far? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. Um, I, I agree with you. Look, I think um, what's interesting about uh, When Night Stirred at Sea is the focus on um, artists from um, Ang- English speaking um, countries in the diaspora, whereas a lot of the artists that are known from the Caribbean tend to be Latin speaking. And that's sim- in part because of the proximity and exposure that you get to like, whether it's the Havana Biennial or Miami art fairs or, th- or things like that. Um, yeah. They, they just seem to be um, more uh, known. And you, what's also really interesting about um, this exhibition is the pairing of artists from multiple generations. So you have some quite senior artists um, based, uh, like Van Lee Burke, who's based in the UK, has been photographing for many decades. Owen Gordon, who's a painter based in, in Toronto, also painting uh, for many, many decades. And then you have someone like uh, Ela Lovelace Kunert who's 18 years old, um, you know, and, and so, uh, and it's, uh, it's really interesting. One of the great things about being able to have the 360, particularly as we remain closed, um, is that you get to see the works uh, in, in dialogue with each other, the way that they are laid out in the space. Um, and so that's a little bit of a different experience than kind of going through, whether it's sequentially, the way that the artists are presented on the microsite, um, but you can just kind of have that more immersive experience. So I think um, from what I understand, uh, I don't have the stats to hand, but I think the traffic has been, been pretty good. And, and I think some of the nice things about having these programming, like the artist talks, um, the next one, which you mentioned, January 28th, um, which will focus on uh, painters and, and mixed media and textile artists, um, is that brings kind of renewed interest and traffic to the site. And, and like my colleagues, um, Allison and Anne said, I mean, it's it's really cool to um, be able to show this kind of an exhibition um, that people can access it from all over the world. Um, so that's been a really exciting thing because, you know, as much as we um, would love to be on, on uh a global radar. Um, this is one way that we can do it when, when uh, you know, maybe trekking out to Brampton isn't isn't uh, possible for everyone. So, yeah, and, and I must add that the last artist talk that you guys did, which was towards the end of November, um, mm-hmm. s- was sold out, which is fantastic. Like there was, was a large contingent of people that tuned in online. Um, does that does that kind of, you know, give you hope for, for the future regarding where PAMA programming can go, um, even, even post pandemic, like as, as we, as we see the light at the end of the tunnel, which has been sort of the buzz term or the buzz phrase that everyone's using now that we have vaccines, Mm -hmm. do you foresee that these virtual panels could continue in some shape or form, just based on the fact that you had such success with the one last month? Yeah, I think um, I, I do think that um, it's something that we our virtual offerings are offering things in, in multiple platforms is something that we will continue. I mean, I think it's something in the arts and culture sector that's been talked about for a long time, but because we always have so many things on the go, it's, it's it has tended to be on the back burner. But with COVID, we all were sort of forced into this new realm. But like you said, I mean, the uptake, uh, there's obviously an interest. Um, there's an interest in the kinds of programming that we're we're doing at PAMA. Um, This was planned, I I know we've mentioned on this show before, you know, well before um, some of the activist uh, movements and events uh, earlier in the summer, like Black Lives Matter, but it, you know, it certainly makes sense for our our community. But I, I just think that that kind of diverse programming, but also offering it in different platforms is, is certainly something to, to continue. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I'm going to keep you, Michelle, just for the next question, because Ooh, um, sure. exactly like, like I mentioned, I think January 28th is a great segue to talk about uh, what else is on deck for 2021. Like I know when Night Stirred at Sea will be wrapping up, I guess, at the end of, the end of, at the end of January. February. But there's, 
of Feb- at the end of February, sorry. Mm-hmm. And then I know that there's other exhibits planned. Uh, I know there's one called Power Play, which I believe focuses yeah. more on 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 hockey history. There's a lot of other great virtual exhibitions. Let us know what uh, what early 2021 looks like from an exhibition standpoint. Yeah, so we um, we're hoping that we'll reopen um, before too long. I mean, that's everybody's that's the million dollar question. Um, but we do have uh, some programming in person, and but we certainly we'll continue virtually. And so, yeah, Power Play um, that you mentioned uh, is looking at hockey uh, through Canadian contemporary art, and it's really um, a, an innovative and unique exhibition. It's it's uh, brings together work by 14 artists from across Canada. And it's inspired by the idea that yes, we know that hockey is our national pastime and that kind of conjures up all kinds of ideas, but it's actually taking a look at hockey uh, and its history as an inclusive sport. So you have, um, it's done thematically and looking, um, exploring um, through the lens of gender or race, um, sexuality, and certainly nationalism, um, but also, you know, differing abilities, physical and mental health, um, self-esteem. So uh, I think it'll be a really different, uh, different take on, um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see too, too many, not that there's anything wrong with it, but any kind of very quaint scenes of like, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, shimmy or like, you know, pick up hockey and things like that. Um, so there's, uh, it, it really is sort of looking at it from a, a broader and uh, diverse uh, lens. Um, and then we'll, we'll have a virtual exhibition um, for really wonderful exhibition that's on view in the museum um, called Our Voices, Our Journey. And because of COVID, um, it uh, was only on view for a very short time, I think maybe a couple weeks max mm. before the lockdown. Um, and so it really looks at a community, a black community in Caledon and um, uh, exactly kind of as it says in the title, um, you know, through their voices, through through their stories and learning um, how the community was formed and, and uh, people's kind of journeys uh, to to peel. Um, so that's a uh, lookout for that in, uh, I think that's launching in February. Um, so February, March. Uh, yeah, so and then we got a few other things up our sleeves for the rest of the year. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very diverse programming. And, and I know that once we roll into, I guess, April and, and May, you know, obviously Sea Characters Month is a big focus for PAMA as well. Yeah. It, like, would you say in general, if you look at the lineup kind of for the next few months and even looking at what's going on right now, um, just how, how crucial is diversity when it comes to coming up with PAMA's programming directions? Oh, I think it's, it's, it's super important, you know, like, I think it's really important to strike a balance, but certainly, I mean, it's really, um, if you're talking about like, you know, kind of our bread and butter or what we do is, is bringing people into our spaces, of course, when that is safe and possible, but people want to see themselves reflected in, Mm -hmm. in the spaces that they visit and you want to be creating um, safe spaces uh, for all, um, you know, and, and the reality is that um, most certainly in urban areas, but, um, you know, uh, we we um, Peel is a is an incredibly diverse uh, region, but you know, as is the wider you know GTA in many urban areas. But certainly Peel, I think it's the most or one of the most um, uh, diverse uh, centers in the country. So um, certainly, um, and you'll see that reflected in our in our programming. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Anne or Allison, either or. Um, I'm curious. We we obviously got a little rundown regarding what exhibits are coming up in in early 2021. Uh, what can we expect program wise? I, 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 Allison, I think uh, before we started recording, uh, you had mentioned the number of I guess at home programs Pama was able to create. Do you want to share that number one more time? <laughs> Yeah, so last year we closed, I think it was the first day of March break that we were actually, it was unfortunately, it timed with our shutdown. And we came out with our family fun activities that were downloadable and available online as of March 16th. Um, So since March 16th of this year, we've launched over 150 um, downloadable activities that people can do for themselves at home that are all available on our website at PAMA at Home. Um, and so then we've got some more of those coming up in the next couple months and we're looking at kind of taking a different spin on it. So we know family day is coming up and that's a really, usually a really big time that we have our doors open and last year had the pleasure of welcoming over 1300 people. 
people. Mm -hmm. um, that's obviously going to look a little different this year. So we're looking at doing some different kind of fun things and having a downloadable escape room for families to kind of use some of the content from PAMA for themselves at home to kind of create a fun environment that the whole family can engage with. Tell me more about this newcomer art project. Uh, I think that's super fascinating. Yeah, we have the absolute pleasure of working with our friends at Moyo Health and Community Services, um, who are, are just such a great connection for the local community um, with 2SLGBTQ+, with newcomers, and really just working with them to provide a voice and sh showcasing the photo voice uh, project that they've been work working on. So they have a variety of newcomers that will be given cameras and documenting their lives for an eight week period. And we'll be working with them to showcase the photographs and the stories of those newcomers in a virtual exhibition as well. Oh, wow. That's, that, that's, that's truly amazing considering, again, and I know Michelle alluded to it earlier, just how diverse Peel is. There is a, a strong newcomer population within Peel. So I guess being able to immerse them within the arts and culture scene is, is, is crucial. And this is a great way of extending that to them as well. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. It's a great opportunity for them to share their own stories. It's not something that we know for them. So we really look forward to giving them a platform to connect with the community and, and to immerse themselves in the culture of the Peel region. Excellent, excellent. This has been a, a, an amazing conversation. I really, really have enjoyed sort of doing this little wrap up on PAMA and looking ahead to, to early 2021. Uh, and uh, just to close it out with you, uh, obviously there's a lot going on and, and it obviously feels like uh, there's a lot of uh, activities and information that PAMA wants to, to really convey to anyone in the community that's interested in, in getting involved and participating. Uh, what's the best way? Where can people go to learn more and, and how can they engage? So we're really excited with the coming year. So I want to encourage people to visit our website and they could always reach out to us on Twitter and on our Instagram. And we also have a Facebook page. So we kindly invite your public to please come out and visit us and look at and view our uh, exhibits and participate in some of our activities. And uh, we want to hear back from the community at large as well. And we want suggestions and ideas of how we can better represent our community and tell their stories and share their stories. Yeah, and I must say, even on the like on, on your social channels, the the vintage content or the throwback Thursday content that <laughs> that's on those channels, I, I always find the most engaging, especially some of the vintage photos of well, well, what Brampton used to look like. I uh, I'm a huge fan of that Kmart image. <laughs> Our archives team are an amazing group of people. They work really hard to keep their to keep the stories fresh. And you know, again, the example that you're providing, and it's that connection that they make to the community, and that's what we want to maintain as we go forward. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you all three of you for joining us. That's uh, Allison uh, Verbanic and Penny Cook and Michelle Gerwartz. All three of them are from the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives, aka PAMA. We'll provide you all the details as to how you can engage with PAMA, not only on social, but online, because they have so much awesome programming taking place. So we'll definitely provide those uh, within our social feeds at New Free Radio across the board, as well as our podcast description. And we are going to take a quick commercial break, and then we're going to come back with more NTR here on News Talk. Saga 960. New Theory Radio is presented by PAMA, the Peel Art Gallery, Museum, and Archives. You are listening to New Theory Radio. And we are back here on New Theory Radio, the show where we theorize on arts and pop culture. My name is Dab Dan when I am your host, and this is the show on News Talk Saga 960 AM. 
And I'm very excited to talk about a special community challenge that's currently taking place within the Peel region, actually within Canada. Participants across Canada are invited to engage in an open innovation challenge focused on reimagining learning and education in a time of unrelenting disruption. Sheridan College is, facil is facilitating the Reimagine Learning and Education in Our Communities Challenge to reach and amplify underrepresented voices, spark inclusive dialogue, and embrace, not hide, from the forces of disruption prevalent in industry and society, all while cultivating meaningful solutions. And here with me to talk about this in greater detail, she is the Director of Creative Campus at Sheridan, Catherine Hale. Catherine, thanks so much for joining us here on NTR. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, super excited to talk about this. I think this is a very fascinating initiative and, and we always love chatting with the educational institutions here on New Theory Radio because we, we are a firm believer that uh, arts and culture uh, would not be where it's at without educational institutions. And we know that Sheridan has played a huge role in just contributing to that within Peel region. But I'm curious, what sparked the idea behind this challenge? Uh, well, the idea started actually at the beginning of the pandemic, our, our president, uh, Dr. Janet Morrison, had the idea to pull together a task force to really rethink what education was going to look like moving forward. So mm -hmm. um, as I think we're all aware, this year has been just disruptive in so many different ways. And the idea was to bring together people to really start to think about, you know, what have things looked like? What are the barriers? How do we need to move forward? What do we need to this to look like? So part of what that task force did was deeply engage with our community. So both internal and external. We use what uh, people refer to as a human-centered design approach. So mm -hmm. the idea that in order to come up with solutions or recommendations, you have to deeply understand the people that you're designing for. So we did a lot of outreach, uh, talked to a lot of people about their perspectives, their values, their experiences, not only in post-secondary, not only at Sheridan, um, but with learning and education more broadly. And one of the things that we heard from a lot of people was that this is a moment that we really need to push the boundaries. We really need to leverage this moment of disruption and engage not just in a conversation about, you know, even our local communities, but thinking about uh, ed learning and education from a much broader kind of national perspective. Um, so that's where the idea for the Open Innovation Challenge was born. It really came out of um, what we heard from our community was needed at this moment in time. You know, the purpose of this challenge is to, to, to what you mentioned, reimagine learning and education in our communities. And you answered this in the previous answer regarding why now is the right time to embark on something like this. But I'm curious with everything that's happened this year, not just with the pandemic, but what else with also the social injustice movement, um, has that, in your opinion, uh, changed or even provided some greater input from from participants or even just from some of the voices that you surveyed at the earlier stages regarding what's needed from an education and learning uh, perspective? Absolutely. That has been a, a huge catalyst uh, for uh, developing something like this Open Innovation Challenge. So as you noted, it's not only the pandemic that has been a kind of catalyst for change, but, you know, the social justice movement, Black Lives Matter, calls for Indigenous rights. These are all things that the education sector in particular is grappling with, but it's also something that much broader within our community is we need to be thinking about, we need to be learning about, we need to be unlearning uh, in some cases, and we need to really, how do we take advantage of this moment? To, to really rethink our structures, our systems, um, and to ensure that, you know, all youth and adults can reach their full potential and, and no one is left behind. Excellent. Excellent. You know, the challenge really encourages community engagement and input, which I think is, is so crucial right now. And, and I find that when you truly uh, go about getting input from those that live in the area, and, and in this case, from all across Canada, it really sheds a light on the kinds of information that you'll be able to get and the kinds of insight that you'll be able to get out of it as well. Um, how does Sheridan hope to use this information? 
So right now, and, and I think we'll talk about this at more length in a bit, but right now we're in uh, what's called the inspiration phase. So mm. our inspiration stage of, of a human centered design process. And that's the stage that is centered around deep understanding, deep engagement with community. So mm. on one level right now, that's, that's a, a big focus. One of the reasons um, that uh, right now Sheridan really wants to engage during this phase is to ensure that we have uh, a wide array of perspectives represented because all of the information when people submit, of course, there's an opportunity to win prizes. So in the inspiration phase, you know, you can make a short video or, you know, uh, submit an artwork that that communicates uh, your team's perspective mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollar prize. But I would say even more importantly, that information will go on to inform the later stages of the challenge. So the idea that when people get get into the ideation phase where they're coming up with solutions, coming up with recommendations for how we're going to have meaningful change within learning and education, that they're really rooted in those perspectives and that input from um, our wider community. And then more broadly, those solutions, I think we're seeing them again, this is a national dialogue um, as sparking models and thinking about what this can look like for the future. So it's not just Sheridan uh, where we're hoping to see these ideas come into play, but rather how do we really uh, catalyze a national dialogue that will get people thinking about learning and education in different ways? And how do we ensure that those conversations include as many people's perspectives as possible. So it's almost like a lead by example approach that you're hoping Sheridan can take when it comes to the outcomes of this challenge. Am I correct? Exactly. I mean, Sheridan is committed to galvanizing education. Um, our new strategic plan really lays out our, our commitment to, to rethinking education moving forward. But part of that is that we want to create a platform to, to encourage others to have a, a conversation, to rethink their systems, their institutions, so that we are approaching this on a much broader scale. Um, not only I would say we, we really do want to go local. We want to have those those conversations within community, but it's that sort of idea of go local to go global, which is, you know, think about um, those important conversations, think about those perspectives, ensure that they're part of the dialogue, and then see how those those solutions, those recommendations come into play, not only in a local community, but how do they impact the broader sector? Are the same solutions, you know, uh, coming up that are, you know, for our, our community in Brampton, for example, or um, how does that differ from somebody in British Columbia? Or, you know, how do we think about these things on both a local and a national level? Yeah, it's it's truly fascinating because obviously with the events of this year, we're all pretty interconnected now through through technology. And during a previous conversation that we had with Pama, they were talking about how them being located in Peel, but is no longer a hindrance for them because the pandemic has allowed them to uh, reach people from Japan and all across the world and be able to uh, provide uh, some some awareness as well as some uh, a, plat for a bigger platform for some of the artists that have involved. I almost see that similar approach with this challenge in regards to uh, the the thinking that's being put towards this, or especially from a design standpoint and even from an outcome standpoint. That being that it's you're focusing across Canada, there, there's a big opportunity here to really um, create some mini conversations across uh, across the country. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, that idea that, again, you know, in this moment of, of complete disruption, we've also found, you know, while we're all um, staying very far apart, there's also ways that we've connected deeply with one another and we have an opportunity to have uh, conversation and think about things in new and important ways. And, and we want to make sure that we really embrace uh, that opportunity. Tell me about the different stages involved with this challenge. Uh, I know you mentioned right now, I believe we're in what, the inspiration stage? Yes, so yeah. the inspiration stage that I mentioned uh, runs through the end of January. So this is a stage again, 
that is really focused on getting uh, as many people to share their perspectives uh, and their kind of unique viewpoints. And there's, again, it's a sort of a team challenge. So you partner up with uh, at least one other person and you can have up to five people and mm -hmm. during the inspiration phase it's really centered on you know responding to questions around impactful educational experiences or barriers ex you've experienced or your hopes for the future what would you like to see um what are things that you think need to change uh what are um things that have had uh, a tremendous impact on your own learning and growth. And again, the idea is that not only can you, of course, win prizes, but you're contributing to a larger understanding of the values and the perspectives and um, the important information that will inform our next stage, uh, which is the ideation stage. So that begins uh, in February, about mid-February. And the ideation stage is really centered around coming up with solutions. So mm -hmm. we have a design challenge statement. Um, and it, the idea is that people will respond to that design challenge statement. So um, the, the question is, you know, how might we reimagine learning and education within our communities so that all you youth and adults um, can reach their full potential and no one is left behind. And so during that ideation stage, teams will really respond to that question. They will develop a kind of preliminary concept that they'll submit. From that stage, they are then refined down by, uh, we have a, um, a reviewer who, who go through the, the, the submissions. And from there, 25 teams move on to what's called the iteration stage. So that's in many ways a kind of incubation stage. You know, um, participants participant teams will be assigned a mentor. They get to dig really deep, kind of incubate that idea a little bit more. And then from then, uh, it's narrowed even further to 10 teams who go on to the final and do a pitch. And then there are five winners and uh, there are $10,000. Um, there's five prizes of $10,000 at that stage. So wow. five will win uh, $10,000 each. There's over $60,000 in prizes over the entire run of, of the, the challenge, but that's the final kind of uh, big finale where we, we select um, the successful teams. Yeah. And $10,000 is, is a lot of money for, for kickstarting an idea or even just putting it towards uh, a new way of thinking. I think with $10,000, you can definitely make that stretch, especially now that we're use of this digital economy, there's a lot that you can do with that, with that amount of money. Absolutely. And we wanted to, to make this something where there's an opportunity, of course, to, to get excited about winning prizes, but also um, contribute to that, that larger national dialogue and have the opportunity to, to have the ideas that you are creating, you know, shared um, much more broadly and, uh, and, and potentially, you know, impact real change. And then just to, to clarify, when would that final stage take place? Would that be towards the end so the of the next year? The grand finale event is in uh, early June. Early June. Okay. So it early to mid-June. Yeah. Wow. No, it's a pretty comprehensive uh, process, but I think each process obviously feeds into the other. So I, I think anyone who gets involved is, uh, is, is definitely in for, for quite the journey. And you know, one question I want to ask you, Catherine, uh, especially you being a, being uh, someone who's very much rooted in education, you know, you obviously have a PhD and, and you're so uh, well versed in, in the community that surrounds Sheridan and, and even Sheridan as a whole. Um, in your opinion, how does education shape the culture of a city? I think that's a great question. And, and I love your lead in because I think that's an important thing um, to think about is that a lot of times, you know, we have a conventional idea of what learning and education looks like. We think about colleges, we think about universities. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, uh, you know, I shared the design challenge statement with you a little bit earlier. One of the things we really wanted to do was make sure that there's space for thinking 
you know, outside of the box, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, about what learning and education looks like. So, you know, if we're thinking about the landscape of a city, you know, there's, of course, you know, you think about the ways in which communities can grow uh, around institutions, you know, people talk about college towns or uh, ideas like that. But at the same time, um, we also have to be thinking about who is left out of those conversations. And, you know, they may be in some ways gathering points, but uh, in in other ways, there's there's moments of exclusion uh, where both institutions and the communities um, who are engaged with them uh, not everyone has been part of that 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 community or felt welcomed within that community. And I think in thinking about how learning and education, you know, shape a community, I think it's really important. And, and one of the things we're really trying to encourage with this challenge is to break away from, from feelings that we have to be tied to a conventional notion uh, and, and push the boundaries of what that looks like. What can, you know, an institution like Sheridan learn from a community group who gathers uh, in informal ways and or, you know, a mentorship relationship between an elder learn a community and a young person, you know, how can we look at some different models of learning and education and and really think about them in ways that will transform not only institutions, but more broadly, you know, how we think about education across our cultural landscape. Yeah, like the way I I see it and being someone that used to live close to to Davis campus back in the day, um, it was truly an anchor, like it was truly just this this place that again anybody who was growing up in and around that area like you knew that there was there was it was, it was just a, an, an epicenter of education and, and uh, that could probably be said for you know any school that's located you know in Brampton or you know across the world but ultimately having Sheridan and knowing that hey this is for a lot of people one of the final locations that they go to before they kickstart their career, uh, it really allowed it to play such a crucial role to the community and really setting people up for success. And I like yeah. the fact that as you as you were talking about um, how it can shape the culture of a city, just uh, again, almost thinking outside of just, just uh, you know, obviously including the students, but also thinking about the residents and how that uh, Sheridan could play a similar role for them as well. Absolutely. And and one of the things, too, is that, you know, I myself, for example, as you've noted, have gone through a very kind of conventional education process. And part of what we want to do with this challenge is make sure that it's not just people like me at the table who mm-hmm. have grown up in a particular system, have values that are rooted in that system. But instead that we are bringing in multiple perspectives so that we can shape something moving forward um, that will really ensure that all people have an opportunity to thrive. A couple more questions before we wrap this one up, Uh, Catherine. What have we learned about the power of education this year with everything that's happened? And and specifically, I wanted to mention, obviously, the pandemic that we're currently in, in, um, but as well as the uh, social injustice movement, which I know is, uh, is something that the innovation, the open innovation challenge is, is really using as a, as a catalyst for, for some thinking. Right. And I think, yeah, it's a big question. Uh, but I think part of what we've experienced over the last year has reminded us, first of all, how powerful education is, how important it is, uh, how important lifelong learning is. So, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, I touched on earlier this idea that we both need to learn and unlearn in some mm-hmm. cases. I agree. Um, we also have to think about uh, our structures and systems um, and think about, you know, it, it's interesting. I did a facilitation um, recently with a group of youth uh, from our region. So students from about grade eight to grade 12. And one of the questions that I asked them was, you know, can you describe one of the most impactful educational experiences or learning experiences that you've had? And the first question um, that several students asked was, does it have to be in the classroom? Oh, wow. Right. Right? And I thought that was really interesting. And I said, no, it can be from anywhere. And the 
floodgates opened uh, in terms of the responses. The students got really excited talking about, you know, whether it was a field trip that they'd gone on or, um, you know, a day at work with uh, someone in their community so that they could learn about a particular job or participating in a sports team or attending um, a national level conference for youth. Uh, and I think that reinforced for me also that when we talk about the power of education, again, building on what we've just talked about, we really need to think expansively. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, it does not mean, you know, that, that we need to do away with classroom learning. By all means, you know, there's incredible value there. But I think as we're thinking about what the future looks like, we have to listen to, in particular, you know, um, learners at all stages uh, who are saying, you know, there's things that are important to me, there's experiences I've had that have really shaped me as a person. And how do we really think about this in, in a, a holistic way? How do we support learners um, to engage uh, in, in all of these different kind of opportunities for growth? Yeah, and it, it kind of brings me back to a to a piece of piece of advice I got very early in my life, uh, especially I think I pretty much got this advice while I was doing my undergrad, was the saying of "Don't let school get in the way of your education." And and again, I know I'm saying that to uh, to to someone that works for an institution, but I almost feel Sheridan is is almost living that right now because it's it's no longer is the is the institution of Sheridan just feeling confined to the buildings or buildings that exist in Brampton, Oakville and Mississauga, but it's now thinking deeper with the purpose it could have even outside of the walls that exist within the classroom. And, and I think that's very interesting. Well, exactly. And that's the thing is that we want students, of course, to get the core knowledge of their discipline to make sure that the training that they're coming for is front and center within their learning experience. But we also want to provide them with the kind of supports that you describe. We want to think about what learning looks like, um, both within and outside of the classroom, both within the institution, and then permeable walls and boundaries within that broader community that were connected. And again, you know, we need um, members of our communities to sh share their experiences in order to really design um, the kind of learning that will serve them well. Excellent. Excellent. Catherine, I want to thank you for, for the time. This has been a very enlightening conversation. Uh, before we conclude, I do want you to, to let the listeners of New Theory Radio and Saga 960 know how they can get involved uh, with, with the challenge. I know you're currently in the inspiration stage, but if anybody wants to learn more, if anybody wants to get involved in the stage, if that's possible, what, what, is the, what is the best way? Absolutely. So the best way is to visit, we have a challenge website and the, the address is challenge college.ca And so if you go to that website, again, it's challenge.sharedincollege.ca. You should find all of the information about how to participate, you know, timeline for the challenge, different things that you can submit. And of course, course, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome. There's multiple different avenues to reach out uh, and we'd be happy to support you uh, in, in participating in this challenge. Excellent. Excellent. That's Catherine Hale. She is the director of creative campus at Sheridan College. And we're so thankful to have her here on NTR. And yes, go check out the uh, Sheridan Open Innovation Challenge. We'll provide all the information that Catherine has just provided uh, on our social channels, as well as uh, the podcast description when it comes out on Tuesdays. And this actually concludes this week's edition of New Theory Radio. So uh, big shout outs to my little brother, Amit Nanwa, for doing our graphics. Big thanks to our music uh, music man, Dusty Loops, at Dusty Loops. Go send him a follow at Dusty Loops across those social platforms. If you want to connect with me, it is at Nav Nanwa on Instagram and Twitter. If you want to connect with the show, it is at New Theory Radio across all platforms. And this is a wrap for this week. Tune it into next week as we do our special look back on 2020. And you will hear all of us next time. Peace.
Hey, what are you giving for the holidays? Don't let it be another knickknack nobody needs. Give something that will actually help the planet and delight someone you love. Plant a tree. With one tree planted, you can donate to plant trees as a unique holiday gift. And feel good knowing that your gift will help clean the air, filter water, and provide habitats for wildlife. Go sustainable this holiday season. Your first tree is on us. Check out OneTreePlanted.org and use code HOLIDAYS to get your free tree. Then pat yourself on the back for the best gift ever. Hey, what are you giving for the holidays? Don't let it be another knickknack nobody needs. Give something that will actually help the planet and delight someone you love. Plant a tree. With One Tree Planted, you can donate to plant trees as a unique holiday gift and feel good knowing that your gift will help clean the air, filter water, and provide habitats for wildlife. Go sustainable this holiday season. Your first tree is on us. Check out OneTreePlanted.org and use code HOLIDAYS to get your free tree. Then pat yourself on the back for the best gift ever.